In this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural interactions with major world crops. Now, the diversity of food crops that we eat is very low compared to the diversity of food plants in the world. There are about 50,000 edible plant species across the world. Now, only 250 to 300 of these are food crops. Of these, only 15 crops provide 90% of the world's food energy intake. So that's 15 of 50,000 edible plant species. Actually, when you think back now to the lecture that you heard on wild plant use uh, for food, you can get an appreciation of the great diversity of species that are consumed wild. Of these 15 crops, only three crops provide 60% of the world's food energy intake, which is quite amazing. And these food crops, of course, as you may guess, are rice, corn and wheat. These are all what we call cereals, or they're the grains of grasses, and so most of the world's culture depend on cultivation of grass grains. In fact, 70% of Earth's farmlands are dedicated to grain production. It's quite amazing, 70%. These grains are used to, f to uh, f feed both humans and animals, particularly cattle. Of over about 9,000 species of grass that occur worldwide, only 35 have been cultivated, and only 12 have become important food crops. Rice, wheat, and corn have become particularly successful because of their ability to grow under so many different types of conditions. They're, they're, they're able to be grown in so many different parts of the world. This table just gives you an example of uh, the importance of grasses in terms of the top world crops. You can, uh, this is a list of the top 25 of them, and those that are in bold are grasses, so sugarcane, wheat, rice, maize, etc. Top annual world crop production. This is a picture of a typical grass plant. When we talk about grains, what we're talking about is the seed of the grass plant. You can see here the flowers on the grass plant, and um, it's the seeds that are used generally. Um, and what we call grains. Of course, other grass plants are also used like sugarcane, and that's the stem, and of course, not the seed. I want to talk a little bit about these three very important grass plants that make up most of our diet. So let's start with rice. Rice feeds more people worldwide than any other crop. It was cultivated from about 10,000 years ago in the Yangtze River region of China. Rice is grown in flooded fields or paddies, which many of us may have seen pictures of at least, but also in upland or dry regions as well. Rice has been an integral part of Asian cultures for thousands of years. It is and was considered a sacred symbol and a symbol of fertility. That's why you often see it thrown at weddings. Um, it's important in many different cultural events, and believe it or not, it was unknown in the West until about 320 BC. There are three major races of rice, all of the same species, um, Oriza sativa, which include indica, which we think of, or we, which is called long grain rice in the United States, japonica, or short grain rice, and japonica, which is, has a much uh, smaller distribution. But of course, there are thousands upon thousands of varieties which have been developed by diverse human cultures over literally thousands of years. Botanists have done studies looking at the number of varieties that people grow in certain cultures. And just an example, one study showed that Thai farmers recognized over a hundred varieties of rice. Of course, different varieties of rice are grown for different um, ecological conditions and used for different cultural practices or cultural events as well. Rice is an integral part of many cultures, in particular Asian cultures, and a great example of this is a traveling theater that's come to here, UH, last year and the year before as well, called The Art of Rice. And I'll read what it says on the advertisement because I think it's a great example of the importance of rice in culture. It says, despite differences in history, customs, and culture, the integral role of rice is the one certainty in all Asian nations. 
rice is grown, consumed, revered, and integral to life in Asia. Through a combination of traditional and contemporary performing techniques, the art of rice presents rice as a complex metaphor representing the balance and imbalance of nature, spirit, ecology, and humankind in today's world. Again, really illustrates the importance of rice in Asian cultures and elsewhere. Rice, of course, is developed into many different kinds of products as well, as you can see here. Rice isn't only used as food, rice is also used for other purposes. As an example, out in the Waianae Mountains, there was a burn a couple of years ago that burnt down some very nice native Hawaiian forest. Uh, it was on a really steep slope, and so the state wanted to put in some um, soil erosion barriers to prevent the soil from running down into the streams. They bought these um, bags, and they were actually stuffed with rice to hold them there. Since then, rice has sprouted up in the Waianae Mountains, and this is a picture of it. It won't reproduce up there, but this is just an example of, uh, many of, the, of the many diverse uses for rice today. So if rice feeds more people worldwide than any other crop, wheat is actually the most widely cultivated cereal in the world, also known as the staff of life. It was domesticated about 9,000 years ago in the Near East, and like rice, there are thousands of varieties. There's also a couple of different species. Durham wheat is um, Triticum turgidum, which is what's used for making pastas often, and bread wheat is a different species, and which is used um, to make breads. While species still occur today in places like Iraq, Iran, and Turkey, although most of the production comes now from Ukraine, U.S., Canada, China, India, etc. Some of you may have heard of, these are, this is an example of the different kinds of wheat that are grown and, and how their morphology changes. Some of you may have heard of spelt. Um, you can see spelt as being the long, skinny one on this picture, and this is uh, one of the varieties of wheat. Wheat, of course, like rice, is transformed to many different products, including breads and pastas. Corn, or zea maize, formed the basis of the new so-called New World civilizations, those across the Americas, including the Maya, the Aztec, the Inca, etc. It's now widely accepted that corn was domesticated in southern Mexico from its ancestor, Tercinte, about 7,700 years ago. When Columbus arrived in the Americas, they found more than 300 different varieties of corn that were already being grown. Today, of course, there's major different um, commercial types, including flint, flour, dent, sweet, waxy, popcorn as well, and of course, hundreds of varieties. Now, these different varieties have been selected by human cultures over time, over thousands of years, for different purposes. Again, according to, to meet ecological conditions and also for different cultural practices. So different types of corn, as you can see here, can be very important and very specific to certain cultural events could depend on their size, on their color, on their shape, on their texture, on their taste, etc. And this, this picture really shows the diversity of corns that have been selected over time. Tercinte is the long skinny one right in the center. Popcorn, for those of you who are interested, is the cob on the furthest right. It contains mostly dense endosperm inside this tough coat. So as the kernels heat up, the starch expands, and that, that outer layer, the pericarp, holds firm until the dense suddenly swells and bursts open and ruptures the wall, and that's how we get popcorn. So popcorn is just actually a type of corn, a specific type of corn. And corn, of course, is made into a whole bunch of different products like rice and like wheat, including cornbread, tortillas, atole, certain, which are, or corn drinks, fermented corn drinks, etc. Different varieties of corns are important for different cultural events, such as marriages, births, deaths, etc. So over time, rice, corn, wheat have been selected by humans and turned into literally hundreds or sometimes thousands of different varieties that have specific cultural purposes that differ in their morphologies and in their phenologies and the way that they grow 
and that are suited to different ecological conditions. So an enormous diversity has been created over time due to human selection. And human selection has an enormous effect on the morphology and the ecology of these grain plants. And humans have selected for a lot of different things depending on what they want, but there are certain things in particular. For instance, humans have selected for the erect form of grasses and less branching because of course these are easier to grow and easier to harvest. If you think about grass that grows on your lawn, it has all kinds of tillers and stolons in it and it spreads across. Grass that grows upright is much easier to plant and to harvest. There's been selection for short plant stature. This of course makes it easier to harvest as well. There's been selection against shattering of seeds. All plants want to disperse their seeds as best they can, so they have a greater chance of surviving and, and growing. The seeds have a greater chance of surviving and growing up to become adults. This isn't good for harvesting because we don't want the plants to be, the seeds to be dispersed or shattered with the wind. We want them there so we can harvest them. So there's been selection against the shattering of seeds so you can come by and harvest them while they're still in the plants. And for some grains, like barley, rye, and oats, there's been selection for what's called free threshing. In many wild plants, the seeds remain attached to the spikelets or to the bracts of the flowers. But in free threshing, the seeds and the fruits separate from them, so again, it makes it much easier for us to obtain the seeds. Now, along with grains, almost every of the major civilizations since the development of agriculture and I say almost, has had a legume as well as a grain of, as part of its support system. So classic examples, of course, include rice, which is grown with soybeans in Asia, corn, grown with beans in, in the Americas, barley, grown with lentils, etc. Now, most legume species form root associations with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The nitrogen-fixing bacteria takes nitrogen from the air and converts it into a form that's usable by the plants. So this makes these plants, these legumes, rich in protein and also allows them to enrich the soil with usable nitrogen. So it's good from a health perspective and good from an agricultural and ecological perspective as well. Soybeans are the most important legume crop in the world. They were domesticated in northeastern China some 3,000 years ago and were one of the sacred crops of the ancient Chinese. Just like rice and corn and wheat, soybeans have been developed and prepared in all different kinds of forms and these vary across cultures. So you've got things like soy milk or tofu, tempeh, etc., which are all different kinds of preparations of soybeans or eating them raw as well or eating the seeds now toasted, as you'll often find in health food stores today. Like the grains, of course, legumes were, select, were subject um, to human selection pressures as well. In particular, in legumes, humans have selected for the reduction of seed scattering, of course, to make the harvesting easier. For the increase in seed size, of course, the bigger in size the seeds are, the better that is for us, the more food and nutrition it is per seed. Uh, in term, uh, they have selected for synchronous flower, that means flowering at the same time, so that uh, whereas in the wild, legume plants might flower throughout the year, we've selected for flowering all at one time, so that makes the harvest much easier as well. And for a lack of dormancy, in the wild, Plants can produce seeds that some of them will germinate right away and others will stay in the soil dormant for a certain period of time and then only germinate according to certain conditions. What humans want, of course, are seeds that germ all germinate right away so that when we plant them, they'll come up right away and they'll come up around the same time. So humans have selected for a lack of dormancy in legumes as well. Now, I said that uh, most civilizations have depended on a, on a grain and a legume to, as the basis of their sustenance, but certainly not all. And Polynesian societies are a great example of, of um, a great society that did not, does not or did not depend on cereals, but rather on storage crops from modified stems and roots. So of course, taro or kalo, uh, sweet potato, ape, etc., the things that you've already learned about. The crops that are major world crops today for us, of course, are all native to one part of the world where they were domesticated and then spread throughout the world through trade over time, some a long time ago and some much more recently. And as these plants 
have moved over space and time, cultures have adopted and adapted them um, to their own cultural traditions. And we can see this when we look again at the past and contemporary movement of crops over time. So just to give you some examples, mango is a fruit that we take for granted here in Hawaii. A lot of us associate mangoes with just any, kind of any tropical country. They're probably the most popular fruit across the world. Uh, but mangoes, however, are native to South Asia and Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, mangoes can be revered. They're often seen as a symbol of goodness. The shape of a mango in parts of India is a sacred symbol. So they're very important culturally. Uh, from the 1700s, the mangoes were, were transported by the Europeans, I think, um, to Latin America, where now mangoes are a staple, are very important food in Latin America. They're important here in Hawaii. And every culture adapts it to its own uses. So here is a great example of mango being adapted, having been adapted and adopted into local culture. Chilies, of course, are another great example of these. Chilies are a major world crop today. They were domesticated in Mexico about maybe 9,000 years ago. They were an indispensable part of the native Mexican diet when Cortez first arrived there. There were numerous varieties there already, having been selected by the Mexicans, and they were consumed apparently with every meal. Of course, there's many varieties today, and they've been selected in many, in diff by different parts of the world. And although native to Mexico, they've become an absolute integral part of many cultural cuisines, including Indian cuisine, Indonesian, Korean, some parts of Chinese cuisine, etc. Chili peppers have also been adopted into Hawaiian culture. This is another great example, Hawaiian chili peppers. One interesting thing to point out here as an aside is that people often think that chili is native to Hawaii, and that's because the Hawaiian name for chili, nioi, is also the name of a bark of a native Hawaiian tree that is spicy. So when chili pe peppers came into Hawaii, that name the spice of the spicy bark was then transferred to the chili peppers. A third really great example of the ways in which crops move across cultures and then are adopted and adapted into them are tomatoes. Tomatoes are native to Latin America and apparently first domesticated or thought to be first domesticated in Mexico sometime before 500 AD. They were introduced to Europe in the early 1500s, but they were first rejected there because they're part of the nightshade family. A lot of these species are poisonous, and so the Europeans rejected it. When they were introduced into the United States, they were not immediately adopted either. In fact, they were grown primarily as a horticultural plant or ornamental plant, and people thought they were disgusting and that they were poisonous. It wasn't until 1820 when somebody ate them and decided to eat them in public in front of a large crowd that the tide the tide turned and people began to eat them. Now, of course, they're an integral part of the diet in the United States. They're grown around the world. They're an integral part of Italian food. But you've got to remember, again, Italian cuisine didn't have these until they were introduced from Latin America a few hundred years ago. So again, great examples of the ways in which world crops are moved across space and adapted and adopted by local cultures. This is another example of the ways in which plants diverse regions become adopted by a culture and then in, and then associated with that culture. I have a cookbook, a Hawaiian cookbook, that lists the vegetables that are associated with different cuisines, and this is a list of Filipino vegetables. So the book included okra, bitter melon, morongai, chop suey yams, and tamarinds, and you can see the diverse places where these different foods have come from. They've been adopted into Filipino culture and now considered Filipino vegetables as crops move across the world and as people move across the world as well, um, recipes are changed and adapt as well. So here's an example of changes in a Portuguese soup, which was originally kale soup in Portugal. In India, it became kale and spices, because of the spices there. In the Caribbean, it is made now from taro leaves. Now you know from your lectures that taro is not native to the Caribbean, but is eaten there. And in Hawaii, it became kale and sausage. Again, an example of the ways in which plants and culinary traditions are changed as they move from place to place and culture to culture. Another consequence of the movement of plants across different cultures is that the same, very same plants are grown and used differently by different cultures today. Any of you who have traveled outside of the country, I'm sure, would have seen examples of this. One great example, though, is bananas. Most people in the United States are 
familiar with only one type of banana. However, there's many different varieties of bananas that have been developed and are eaten in different parts of the world. And not just the banana is used um, of the banana plant. The banana leaves are often used as cooking as for wrapping things. And banana, banana flowers, as you can see here, are also an important part of, of some culinary traditions. Bananas here in the United States tend to mostly be eaten raw, the fruit, or, or ripe, whereas in other, other places bananas are eaten green and most of the time they can be cooked. So again, the parts of the plant ver that are eaten vary across cultures and the ways in which they're eaten and the processing really varies as well. So I've been talking about major world crops that we're all familiar with. Remember though, these make up a very, very small portion of crops that are grown worldwide. And if you go and explore any of the markets where you might live, any of the markets here in Honolulu, in Kalihi, or in Chinatown, you'll find a whole diversity of other kinds of crops, very important in certain cultural cuisines that are eaten today. These include all kinds of plant parts, different kinds of fruits, different kinds of stems, different kinds of flowers, um, different kinds of leaves, different kinds of roots and tubers. So there's a whole diversity, even though when we go to the supermarkets we see a very low diversity of plants, there's a whole enormous diversity of plants, much of which is available in smaller kinds of markets. Another great example of how some of the same plants are grown and used differently by different cultures are daylilies. This is an article that came out in the Honolulu Advertiser a couple of years ago about how daylilies here, of course, we know them as ornamental plants, but in places like China, they're grown as food crops and are apparently very good sources of beta carotene and are used as salads and soups and other kinds of preparations. Now, major world crops don't just have a large influence on our cultures because we eat them and we incorporate them into our culinary traditions, but they have a big impact on cultures because their very production shapes our landscapes and therefore our cultural landscapes. So the production of major world crops can affect local patterns, local patterns of food consumption, local foods, and local cultural traditions. So for instance, huge areas of the Amazon forests has been and is being cut down for the production of rice, and actually now recently for the production of soybeans. In Hawaii, sugar cane, Pineapples, etc., displaced forests and displaced the crops that were originally grown here, like taro. Enormous banana plantations in the Caribbean displaced the local crops that were grown there and forests as well. So farming these major world crops can transform the landscape and therefore transform the crops that people eat because what was originally and traditionally produced there is no longer produced there because these are there now. And it can also um, transform it in that if there were wild environments like forests before, um, the wild foods that were used or the wild medicines that were used and gathered from those places aren't available either. Growing monocultures of major world crops can also decrease the kinds of weeds that come up, the nature and the kinds of weeds that come up in agricultural plots. And as you've heard in a previous lecture, these weeds can be an important source of food and nutrition, vitamins and minerals for, for women and children and others. The protection of major world crops can also affect local patterns of food consumption and local cultural traditions through the planting of so-called improved varieties, which then go on to take the place of local varieties. This has taken place through the Green Revolution when high-growing, fast-yielding, or fast-growing, high-yielding varieties were developed and introduced into different places in the world, some successfully and others um, not successfully in, at all, or with GMOs today. And although improved varieties can certainly help people in certain places, they can also have negative impacts in that they can take the place of varieties that have been developed over hundreds or even thousands of years to meet specific ecological conditions or to meet specific cultural traditions. One of the other consequences of the great production of major world crops is that uh, when there's overproduction, as there often is of things like corn in the United States or Canada, these get imported to other countries at very, very low prices, and this can inhibit local production of crops and therefore uh, local varieties of crops that are grown or local species of crops that are growing as well can be displaced.
Of course, remember there's always the other side to it and that new varieties are new crops and then therefore incorporated into cultures and new cultural traditions are created. So there's always two sides to this. The adoption of major world crops, though, can also affect the health and nutrition of many cultures through the displacement of traditional foods. So I talked about the displacement of lo'i, or taro patches, in Hawaii through the introduction of other kinds of plants and animals. This can have a very big impact on cultures, whereas the native Hawaiian diet would have been based on taro and fish and limu in the past. It's now based on high carbohydrate and high sugar Western foods that can cause health problems. One example of how adoption of major world crops can really negatively affect the health and nutrition of a culture through the displacement of traditional foods comes from the O'odham in southern United States. The O'odham are thought to have the highest rates of diabetes in the world. Traditionally, the O'odham diet consisted of, of cultivation of beans and corn, which were supplemented with a, a variety of wild foods, including mesquite, cactus pads, acorns, etc. Today, most people eat um, what a typical Western diet is, processed wheat products, sugar, coffee, etc. Although there may be various reasons involved in the high level of diabetes, it seems now <coughs> through ethnobotanical work that at least part of the reason is this change from a traditional diet to a Western diet. F to test this, the Oram were given traditional foods and then had their blood sugar levels tested and their glycemic index tested. Now the glycemic index is how rapidly the body produces insulin to metabolize sugar. Okay, If you've got a high glycemic index, that means you've got a fast blood glucose response. If you've got a low glycemic index, that means it's a low blood glucose response. So it was found that traditional Odem foods had carbohydrates that were slowly digested, which resulted in a slow rise in blood sugar level and a very low insulin response. In fact, the glycemic index of Odem varieties, traditional varieties of corn, was even lower than that of modern varieties. So it's not just the, the species that's being changed, but the traditional variety had a lower glycemic um, index than the modern variety of corn. And, of course, all traditional foods had lower insulin responses than modern white bread. The reasons that traditional diet had a much lower insulin response was because of the characteristics of these traditional foods. There are starches that are digested more slowly, as I mentioned. They tend to be more fibrous, so the rise in the blood sugar level is slower. They have, many have mucilage that slows down digestion and absorption of starch. And even traditional ways of grinding and processing food can make them less likely to exacerbate diabetes. So again, a change not just in the species that are eaten, but in the varieties of those species that are eaten from traditional varieties to some of the modern varieties, and a change in the way in which the processing of the food is done, all of these things can ex exacerbate health conditions, particularly diabetes in this case. Major world crops can also, of course, act as agents of social and cultural changes. Now, of course, his historically and, and currently as well, they continue to do so. So, of course, classic historical examples, we can look right here at Hawaii. The major planting of sugarcane in Hawaii um, resulted in the bringing of people from different parts of the world, from China, from Japan, from Korea, from uh, Portugal, here to the Hawaiian Islands to work on the sugarcane fields. And this eventually led to the development of what we now call local culture. Uh, other examples, of course, are the movement of slaves, the forced movement from Africans to uh, southern United States, to the Caribbean to work on the cane fields, to South America as well, and the resulting enormous cultural and social, social changes. The movement and the migrations of people continue today and continue to have cultural impacts. Just to give you an example, I've done a lot of ethnobotanical research in the south of Mexico, some of the, the rural and indigenous communities there. A number of years ago, people from those communities who had traditionally not left them but had, had stayed there began to migrate north to work seasonally on tomato plantations and grape plantations in the north of Mexico and the south of the United States. Over the few years that I was working there, perhaps five years, increasing increasing numbers of people left to work up there, would stay there for a few years and then come back. This migration of people and the movement of thoughts and, and cultural ideas has big impacts on the local communities.
Finally, the relationships between culture and crops, all crops and major world crops, are of course dynamic. So it's important to keep in mind that as agricultural practices change, so do cultural practices change. So for example, as people go from producing subsistence crops um, to cash crops, especially world, world food crops um, that have high market prices and are traded across the world, the associated cultural traditions change as well. On the one hand, you may lose the stories and the rituals and the ceremonies um, and the myths that go along with the planting and the, and the production and the processing of those traditional crops. At the same time, of course, you gain new cultural traditions that go along with the planting of the new crops. At the same time, as cultural practices change, so do agricultural practices. A good example of this comes from the use of amaranth in Mexico. Now, amaranth was one of the four most important crops in Mexico before the Europeans arrived. It's a very nutritious crop. It's used and promoted today because of its high nutrition. And it was cultivated over vast territories in Mexico. It wasn't just important in the diet, but it was important in religious ceremonies. It was important for use for the Aztec gods. When the Spanish, uh, and the Spanish came, uh, the missionaries, of course, wanted to destroy the local religion. And they destroyed shrines and idols uh, associated with it, whipped and killed people who practiced the religion, etc. As a result, amaranth, despite being a food crop, because of its strong association with the local religion, disappeared less than a hundred years after the Spanish first arrived. Again, an example of the ways in which food and cultural and religion are all intertwined, and how forced changes in cultural practice um, result in, in, in big agricultural changes as well. So some key concepts to take home. Worldwide agriculture and human diet are dominated by a very small number of plant crops. These crops play an important role in the cultures where they are consumed. Similarly, human cultures have played an important role in shaping the diversity and varieties of these food crops. Production of major world crops can also affect local cultural traditions where they are grown. So not just the consumption, but the production as well shapes the landscape. The relationship between crops and culture is dynamic as both move through space and time.